Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of Inpatient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. This series is in place to help you learn more about the latest in research in myeloma so you can make your very best treatment decisions. It's also to make you aware that if patients participate in clinical trials in greater numbers, we can help move the bar. Today, less than 5% of myeloma patients participate, and hopefully because of this series, that number is growing. I've had many patients raise their hand to say they want to join a trial, and this is wonderful to see. Now, if you'd like to receive a weekly email about past and upcoming interviews, you can subscribe to our Inpatient Minute newsletter on the homepage or follow us there on Facebook or Twitter. And please share these interviews with your myeloma friends. They are a very deep resource. We also have a site called MyelomaCrowd.org. That's the first comprehensive site for myeloma. Please take time, some time to explore the links and go deeper than the homepage. There are references and links to the very best myeloma news sources, lists of who to follow on social media for all things myeloma, a growing online myeloma specialist directory, and current articles on relevant myeloma to- topics. You can also contribute what you're learning by clicking on the Become a Contributor link. We are very honored to have today with us today Dr. Vincent Rajkumar of the Mayo Clinic. So welcome, Dr. Rajkumar. Thanks so much for having me. I really look forward to um, this this show, and uh, I think you're doing a wonderful job. Oh, well, thank you so much. Let me give an, an introduction for you as before we begin. Um, Dr. Rajkumar is a professor of medicine and chair of the myeloma, amyloidosis, and dysproteinemia group at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. He also chairs the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, or ECOG, Myeloma Committee. He has published more than three, 500 articles and 350 abstracts, and his career was profiled in the November 26, 2000 issue of The Lancet. Dr. Rajkumar has an extensive research program in the field of plasma cell disorders. He has led numerous phase one, two, and three clinical trials investigating the role of new agents in myeloma, including the very important randomized trial that led to the approval of thalidomide for myeloma in the U.S. He also leads several large studies investigating the nature, the prevalence, and progression of various monoclonal gammopathies, including myeloma. His lab, laboratory research has been focused on investigating new agents in myeloma and studying the role of angiogenesis in various plasma cell disorders. He has been continuously funded as an independent investigator by the National Cancer Institute through RON grants, which is the highest level of grant researchers can obtain. Researchers can obtain. Dr. Rajkumar serves as an associate editor for the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, section editor for multiple myeloma and related disorders for the journal Leukemia, and is an associate editor for the European Journal of Hematology. He is deputy editor of Blood, Can- of Blood Cancer Journal. He received the Relentless for a Cure Award from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in 2010 and the John Altman Lecture and Award from the American Society of Clinical Oncology in 2011. So, Dr. Rajkumar, we are very fortunate to have you on today's show. Oh, my. Um, what an introduction. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know again whether I... Um, can live up to all of this, but I really appreciate you having me on the show. Oh well, we know you can. <laughs> we've heard we've heard other discussions that you had before, and you're excellent. So I know Thank for you. today we wanted to kind of focus on your research that you've been doing with obesity and race and how that impacts myeloma. So to begin that, I guess did you start with observation in observations mostly in race or mostly on the obesity side? And how did you how did you start to discover this? Um, the the um, the initial studies were all related to race. Obesity came later on. Um, uh, I must say that a lot of the work um, that I've done in the last um, 10 years or so, looking at racial disparities in monoclonal gammopathies, is work that is in close collaboration with Dr. Ola Landgren at the NCI. We've worked like in tandem and teams uh, to address this issue. Um, the fact that multiple myeloma is more prevalent in African Americans uh, compared with whites is well known, and that has been known for for decades. 
it was work done by so many researchers before me. And in what percentages is it more prevalent? Well, um, you know, generally when you say that a particular race has a greater predisposition to a given cancer, you're talking like a 20% increase in risk or 30% increase in risk. You usually don't see like, uh, you know, a 100% increase in risk or, a, you know, a two-, three-fold increase in risk. Such kind of um, uh, disparity is quite uncommon. A multiple myeloma is unique because there is a marked two- to three-fold higher risk of uh, myeloma in blacks compared with whites. And that level of da racial disparity was what got us started because we felt that if we understood the mechanisms of the racial disparity, it would actually um, provide us with clues on why people get myeloma uh, in the first place for all races. And in, in the African-American race, do you see a difference between men versus women, or is it consistent also between the genders? Well, well, um, in general, um, the prevalence of myeloma as well as its precursor conditions is more in men compared with women. It lags about five years uh, in women. Um, as age increases, um, the prevalence uh, of these conditions uh, go up. Uh, when you look at blacks and whites, the uh, the disparity uh, is seen in both men and women and to almost the same extent. Uh, the other striking thing is that the younger you go, the disparity becomes even more. I mean, young black mm. uh, patients have a much higher risk of myeloma uh, than whites of comparable ages. Wow, that's really remarkable. You wouldn't think that. And and I guess when you look at the, the various stages, like an MGUS stage or a smoldering or active myeloma stage, you're seeing the same types of things, especially if you're seeing younger are yeah, you? I mean, absolutely. So the the very first question that we had is, if myeloma is more common in African Americans, is it because there is an increased prevalence of the precursor condition, uh, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, MGUS, since you know all cases of myeloma evolve from an MGUS? Is the disparity because African Americans have a higher risk of MGUS? Is that the reason, or is it because there is a more rapid progression of MGUS to myeloma. Uh, is it the precursor is more, or is it the progression rate that's more? And um, so the initial studies looked at the precursor condition uh, to look at the prevalence, and many studies have been done. Um, most of them are smaller studies, and almost all of them are focused on small parts of the U.S. Uh, we did uh, more recently and published... Um, uh, uh, this year in the leukemia, uh, a study with, uh, in, you know, held in conjunction with uh, Dr. Langren from the NCI, from the CDC Mayo Clinic. It was a study of um, nearly 15,000 uh, uh, persons uh, from all across the United States who were uh, sampled as part of the NHANES study. The NHANES is a nationwide uh, sampling that occurs periodically, mainly for nutritional evaluation. Um, but we utilize those samples to study the prevalence of MGUS. And what we found was that um, there is a two-fold higher risk of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, the precursor condition, in blacks compared with whites. And this is seen in all ages. It's seen in men and women. Wow. And that's a very consistent answer, it sounds like. Yes, it is. It's been known, but it, this is the first time we've seen it uh, clearly demonstrated in a nationwide uh, study that is actually representative of the total U.S. population. Now, when you see something like that, um, uh, you want to find out, you know, what kind of monoclonal gammopathies do 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 patients get? And um, we um, looked at the type of MGUS, and we found that the more higher risk MGUS um, was seen in African Americans. So it's possible that African Americans not only have a higher risk of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, but they may also have a slightly higher rate of progression. Uh, and both of those factors probably contribute uh, to the higher risk of myeloma. Now, we have to study the mechanisms in greater detail, and those studies are ongoing. We're also going to try and find out if 
this whole thing happens because um, blacks get MGUS at a much earlier age than whites, and so we are looking at a population that is age 10 to 50 uh, to try and determine that because depending on the age of onset, the type of risk factors that cause it may be different, and we can get clues from there. I must add that we also looked at um, uh, the differences uh, in MGUS prevalence uh, uh, compared with Hispanics. Now, the NHANES doesn't, uh, at least in the times that we sampled, doesn't code for um, ethnicity separate from race. So uh, all we could look at was people coded as Mexican-Americans. And we found that they had a uh, slightly lower risk of MGUS compared with whites. And that has been seen um, before in other studies as well. And I noticed that there were not only lower rates in um, maybe Hispanic or maybe just specifically in Mexico, and then I saw a reference to Japan also that that's correct. showed um, that lower, were, lower incidence. That's correct. Um, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, have published uh, data from, um, from uh, survivors of the atomic bomb um, where there was higher, you know, radiation exposure. And the initial reason they did that was to find out, you know, whether there was an increased risk of MGUS and myeloma and MDS uh, with uh, respect to radiation exposure. Um, but later on, that, that data was used to compare the rates uh, in Japan to the white population of Olmsted County. And what we found was that uh, what they've, they have found and reported is that... Um, the, that even among those exposed to the radiation from the atomic bomb, um, the, the, the risk is still lower than the white population of Olmsted County. So that's a racial thing. You know, Certain wow. races seem to have a much lower predisposition to getting MGUS. Certain races seem to have more, and, and we have to figure out uh, the mechanisms for the racial disparity because in that lies the answer to why people get myeloma in the first place because there's some genetic factors that are predisposing um, patients to getting MGUS. I mean, actually, we, we Dr. Langren and I, uh, we had a question about, you know, if there is increased risk of MGUS in African Americans in the U.S., you know, is this something that you see in Africa as well, uh, which mm -hmm. may provide a more stronger genetic link? And that was studied in a study uh, from uh, a thousand participants from Ghana. And uh, when you compare the MGUS prevalence in Ghana, uh, age adjusted, um, it's it's twofold higher compared with the whites. Uh, uh, compared with white po with the white population of Olmsted County, so. What we learned is that the increased risk of MGUS in, in blacks is seen not just in African Americans, but, in all, but also in blacks from Africa. And that suggests a genetic predisposition. It's Much not more, certain. Yeah. It's, it's not certain. You can still say some socioeconomic factors are at, are at play. And actually, that's how we landed into the obesity story. Um, I think the credit goes to Dr. Langren for finding this cohort. Uh, there is a cohort of patients in the south. We call it the southern cohort. This cohort was assembled for the study of obesity in, in uh, poor women from the south. Um, and we utilized those samples then to look for MGUS prevalence. And we compared roughly, you know, 1,000 women uh, who were white, uh, 1,000 white women with uh, 1,000 black women. We just compared the prevalence of MGUS. And uh, they were all of the same socioeconomic status so that you, you, could, you could not attribute any differences to socioeconomic status. And we found that, you know, adjusting for that, the risk of MGUS in black women is still higher. And um, that told us, again, you know, it's a genetic thing. It's not socioeconomic um, uh, in that regard. And in that study, then, we found that obesity uh, was a clear risk factor for, uh, the pre for the prevalence of MGUS. And that was seen in, a, in the NHANES study as well, um, but we didn't have statistical significance. But it's, it's clearly there. It's a, um, it's a risk factor close to twofold higher risk. Wow. I did not know that. Now I have a lot of questions about obesity, and I had some, and I had some people email in questions also. So instead of waiting till the end because they're not going to be able to ask those themselves, I'm just incorporating them into 
uh, most of the interview. So sure. another question for um, the African-American population. Is there a younger median age for diagnosis in this population? Yes, I think so. I don't have the data at the tip of my hands, but um, um, again, uh, we are studying the prevalence of MGUS by age right now. Um, but if you look at um, the the way it's been looked at is, you know, if you look at the age 40 to 50, mm-hmm. uh, the probability of getting myeloma in blacks is much higher than whites, and and that. Disparity is higher than uh, than what you see in older ages, so there's something going on, and there's some good. Um, uh, if there is a silver lining, it is in that the. My suspicion is that the type of myeloma that occurs in blacks is the lower risk type, and therefore, when given the exact same therapy, the outcome in blacks is actually better than in whites, for you know, similar populations. So that has been seen in the ECOG trial that I did, uh, which looked at high-dose versus low-dose dexamethasone and lenalidomide, uh, where the the overall survival of non-whites was higher, uh, was better, uh, again, close to two-fold better uh, compared um, compared with whites. And that's been seen and reported by Dr. Langren as well. So, so there might be some survival disadvantage to uh, certain um, uh, certain portions of the African American population due to access differences, but mm-hmm. in when when access is uniform, such as what happens in a clinical trial or when you study an insured population, the outcome is actually better. Which leads us to hypothesize that the type of myeloma that occurs in in blacks, um, even though the prevalence is higher, is probably the lower risk type. And we are trying to find out if this is because, like, for example, the trisomy subtype of myeloma is is the good risk type. And and my hypothesis is that that is probably uh, what's driving the racial disparity and that um, we'll find out soon. Well, that was one of the questions from Dana because she noticed that you spoke about trisomies as being more common in the black population. And although they might have a greater risk of progression from MGUS to active myeloma, they um, have, you know, typically maybe more bone damage but more slower growing type myeloma from other researchers that we've talked to. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But um, so have have you looked at the African American population and tried to separate it out by percentage of the types of translocations? It's mostly 1114, from what you're saying. Uh, it's probably mostly trisomies uh, that's driving the disparity. Uh-huh. Um, that's still a hypothesis. Well, there have been studies. Dr. Fonseca published a paper in Blood looking at the cytogenetic subtypes. Uh, we are doing a study um, with, uh, in collaboration with various medical centers in the U.S. Uh, looking at the cytogenetic subtypes, differences between uh, uh, the various cytogenetic types in blacks versus whites, and actually Dr. Greenberg, uh, one of my um, uh, colleagues here at Mayo, who's doing, who's just finished a PhD, presented an abstract at AACR uh, on the uh, disparities in in prevalence of the various cytogenetic subtypes. The caveat is that. You know, a lot of the differences uh, we need to verify because uh, there is no uniform fish test that is done to look at the cytogenetic subtypes uh, across the U.S. So any difference we find may be just simply based on what probes were used at the various centers Mm -hmm. rather than a true racial difference. So, you know, centers with a larger African-American population may be using a more limited probe set than what's used at Mayo or MD Anderson. And and uh, and then when we compare, for example, we did a st- we, we did some comparison with, uh, uh, with Cook County Hospital, and then we found that some of the probes were simply not used. So then you cannot compare. So it, it's going to take a lot of work because we have to have uniform fish probes that were used in all patients, and then look at the prevalence of each cytogenetic subtype to, to see um, uh, what, is, what, what is driving the racial disparity. I think of myeloma as at least seven or eight different diseases, 
Mm-hmm. And it would be like lightning striking twice if you had uh, increased racial disparity in, in all of the six types. So I think it's just mm-hmm. one or two types at the most that's driving this disparity. And the quicker we find it, we'll we'll know exactly how to tra- target it. But right now, I think uh, from all the studies we have we have found, you know, one that published by Dr. Langren, the ECOG trial, I would say that uh, lower risk subtype, probably trisomy subtype, is probably more increased in African Americans, and and that is the subtype that responds better to lenalidomide and stem cell transplantation, and uh, that's something that. Um, you know, that should be out there. Mm-hmm. As a, maybe a standard treatment protocol? As, so, a, as a treatment protocol that, that patients, are, patients are aware of and doctors, treating doctors are aware that this, um, that um, patients, w- uh, that blacks have really done well in certain studies which utilized, you know, image based therapy and transplant. Okay, and and going back to the FISH test, how long do you think it will take to get a standard fish test across all facilities because um, when we interviewed Dr. Langren, he really focused on that point as well. Yes. Uh, see, the 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 problem is that um, the 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 reason fish testing is done in many centers is just to identify high risk myeloma. So then they will be using probes for say deletion seventeen. 1Q amplification, um, 1416, 414, and deletion 13 maybe. So that panel then tells you whether the patient has a higher risk myeloma or not. And that's the main reason why people are doing it. And so for that purpose, that probe set is fine. Um, But when you want to classify myeloma into various subgroups, you need more than that. You need probes for trisomies, you need probes for 1420, 614, 1114, and uh, the more probes you use, the more expensive it is. And um, and um, so, you know, we have to make a clear case that it's actually important to know what subtype of myeloma patients have before we can generalize that, you know, hey, everybody should be using a comprehensive fish panel. Um, we are moving in that direction. So, you know, the most recent version of the MSMART algorithm is really dependent on the primary cytogenetic subtype of myeloma. And to know that, you, you have to use a full comprehensive probe set. So I'm just hoping that, you know, as we evolve and people start looking at myeloma not as one disease, um, then then we will have this. I don't know how long it's going to take, though. Uh, the better well, way to do it is is to it is to look at size centers that are using similar probes and and look at disparities with the with those cohorts. Well, it seems to me just as a patient observer that um, researchers are really handicapped by not having all of the information that they need to be able to make further discoveries. And and I don't think, from what we understand, you know, the fish you test you you get what you test for. And if you right. don't run those probes like what you're saying, then you just don't capture that data ever. And especially at the beginning when a patient has all those things present and showing up. Right. And and I'm ambivalent only because that, you know, when I wear my evidence based hat, um, if we say to a doctor you should be checking for eleven fourteen, I have to tell them why. Um mm-hmm. and I have to show them data why that is important. So we have to distinguish what's important for research from what's important for practice because then the test is built to the patient. So, And that's why as we collect data and we show that the outcome depends on certain approaches to treatment, as the approach to treatment varies by cytogenetic subtype, then you can rationally say that it's, it's important for patient care, not research, to actual mm. patient care to get these um, uh, results and justify the testing because you know if you're doing it for research and you're you know paying it with research dollars that's one thing if you're billing it to the patient there's got to be a, a clear proof that what you're doing is useful for patient care so i am torn i think it's it's hard to just say what people are doing is wrong unless you have a or you have a a charge that is very similar whether you use one probe or 10 and then you can say yeah better to use everything mhm and let me ask you, because we've talked to several people about whole genome and whole exome sequencing, 
Mm-hmm. Have you used that at all for this population? And has it given you any clues as to maybe some genetic reasons why the black population has a higher incidence of myeloma? Well, uh, I think, again, uh, separating research from practice. Uh, we have participated in the initial myeloma sequencing that was done and published uh, in Nature from the Broad Institute uh, and the MMRF. Um, and and uh, for, from a research standpoint, trying to understand, you know, why people get myeloma and why there is a racial disparity, these tests are going to be invaluable. You're going to get the mm-hmm. whole genome sequenced and look at the exact differences. That's how you'll get the answers. So, yes. However, for practice, and you hear about, you know, companies are offering this or people can get this done, for myeloma, you have to ask yourself exactly what information you will get that is actually actionable. Mm-hmm. And I have not personally ordered a single uh, a, a test for a single patient so far. We have the capability now at Mayo, uh, and we can order it as a clinical test. I have not done it because I haven't encountered a situation where I felt like this would actually change my plan of care. The mm-hmm. probability that a myeloma patient will have a new actionable mutation for which there is a drug that you can use um, is very low at least from what we know, and um, we don't know that that action would actually benefit the patient either. I mean, that data is also not out there. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of data, and then there's not much you can do out of it, and these tests cost several thousand dollars. And uh, so I I am more evidence-based school of thought rather than rationale-based therapy. I need proof that it works. I actually sent out a tweet uh, asking my colleagues if they ever had a patient on whom they've done it and they had an action that could be taken as a result of the test and what the outcome was. I didn't get a single response yet. I mean, I don't know if people don't have such an experience or... They haven't just emailed me, but um, hopefully when they hear this, maybe you can publicize this. I'm looking for an example. Somebody tell me, and it's not like, you know, we found, uh, you know, a BRAF. Um, I just want to know, you found the BRAF and you used the inhibitor, what actually happened? How many months of response did you get? If Mm -hmm. I have even a single case where this helped, then it would change my, uh, you know, line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're looking at it practically in your practice. Right, because you have uh, a patient, uh, and again, who knows whether insurance will reimburse this test, and and who's going to be stuck with the bill? Mm-hmm. And if you if you screen one hundred patients with a thousand dollar uh, several thousand dollar test, and perhaps two or three have an actionable um, thing, and 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 you don't know the outcome of that action, how can we justify it? So we are taking it carefully here. It's not like I'm not going to do it. Uh, we mm-hmm. have a, uh, a center for uh, individualized medicine uh, at Mayo, and they are helping us with this. And so when we have the appropriate patient, you know, with, where there's no real available therapy right now, they've, uh, they're relapsed and refractory, we refer them to that center, and then they will take the, all the pros and cons, uh, counsel the patients, look at the insurance, and then get it. So I, I think in a, few, in a year or two we'll have more data on you know, how many people we have done it like this and, and what the outcome was. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to put, you know, the the. it's always great to talk about the positive, but people have to see the other side and then make a decision with eyes open. Right. And I think part of that is is doing some of the important diagnostics or being more uh, discussing with your provider your cytogenetics because i you know, I attended an a IMF seminar, which was excellent, and I asked everybody to raise their hand if they knew their cytogenetics, and I, 10% of the people in the room raised their hand. So I think if we're going to demand personalized care, we need to know what kind of profile that we have, either through the FISH test or, you know, the other diagnostic testing that is available to us. Yes, I, I think the FISH is becoming more and more uniform. And mm-hmm. some of the reason why you don't see that show of hands is because in the older days we were not doing it routinely. And if you mm-hmm. didn't do it at the very first bone marrow and you had a great outcome after that, you know, you had 
chemotherapy and transplant and urine complete response. There's no way to go back and check now. So uh, the patients are doing well, and, you know, they didn't have the test done at the time. But you would see that, you know, maybe a few years from now, as we have patients from this era get um, uh, showing up at these meetings, you will find more and more people raising their hands, I, I'm pretty sure. It's becoming more uniform now. Mm-hmm. And another question beyond the translocations that might relate to the African-American population, there's also they also have a higher incidence of things like diabetes and renal failure. failure. Are those other things um, drivers for myeloma, or, or what's your conclusion? I know you need to do more studies to find out what, what's driving this, but if you could maybe share your hypothesis about what might be driving some of this. I, 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 you know, we we, have, we we pretty much are blind. I mean, we don't have any data in terms of etiology. The the best mm-hmm. hypothesis that you can give is uh, really look at uh, myeloma as a whole. The, it's a two-step process. Um, we have it's analogous to uh, colon cancer. In a colon cancer, what happens is that you first have the normal colonic mucosa, and then uh, something happens and you, patients develop a polyp. The polyp itself is self-limited, it's benign, but there is a risk that the polyp can become cancer when another hit happens. So sometime in the future, a random hit happens and the, and the polyp becomes a cancer. Uh, similarly, in, in myeloma, the, we all have plasma cells. They're helping us fight infections by making antibodies. And Somewhere along the way, while they are responding to an infection or an inflammation, they, um, there is an error, there's a mistake, uh, like a trisomy or a translocation. And you get MGUS, a clone, similar to a polyp, self-limited, doesn't mm-hmm. do much, just sits around. Um, and then 1% of MGUS patients each year get a second random hit. It's like a chance event. And when that happens, the MGUS then becomes myeloma. Mm-hmm. So now that we know that the racial disparity is there at the MGUS stage itself, um, most likely what is happening is there are some genetic factors, like you know the actual gene sequences. Um, there might be polymorphisms or mutations that predispose um, African Americans to developing this MGUS as they are trying to respond to an infection or an inflammation more readily than whites. And that then makes them have a higher risk of MGUS. Um, and I think that is more likely than, a, than an environmental cause for that. Uh, there may be some environmental component to it, but I don't think it's the driver. And then once the MGUS is there at a higher frequency, then uh, the 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 development of myeloma is just driven by that probability. Well, let's talk about obesity for a little bit, because when you talk about that the infection or inflammation might be the secondary trigger, basically, mm-hmm. um, I think there's a lot that has to do with inflammation in your study and obesity. So maybe you can help us understand why obesity correlates with myeloma or the findings that you or Dr. Langren found and is this just a sugar cancer paradigm or is it is it something else you know again it's it's not at the cancer stage we're seeing it at mgus so it's more more occurring yeah. at uh, okay. the transition from a normal cell to a, clo- a pre-malignant mm-hmm. clone um it's 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 very difficult to just come up with a hypothesis. I know that you know um, there must be some cytokines involved. Um, myeloma cells require IL-6 to grow, um, insulin-like growth factor, and and so on. There might be some differences in cytokines, um, uh, which we all know occur with uh, changes in body weight. And I think uh, again, when a cell is trying to fight off an infection, it is dividing. And if you have some cytokines that uh, help it divide more or faster, that may increase the chances of an error like a translocation or a trisomy happening. Mm. And then that translates into a higher frequency of MGUS. Once you have a higher prevalence of MGUS, then, then the, then the, then it's just, you know, from that point onwards to myeloma, it's just that, that increased prevalence will drive the whole thing. Mm-hmm. 
but you know i'm it's so hard for me to come up with like random theories why there right. might be a difference i i i'm pretty sure after looking at all the data that these are not confounding effects that there are some real effects if you look at enhance for example we looked at so many variables so many variables um from income to smoking to education status to poverty to this like none of those made a difference mm. uh, obesity there was a clear trend uh inflammation like you know by rheumatoid arthritis there was a trend they all didn't reach statistical significance but it, there was a trend and um we're going to study that more we we'll pull it with the second cohort that we are studying right now another 12000 patients so then we'll have more sample size to look at these differences mhm mm and have you seen a difference with obesity in myeloma in men versus women? Yeah, there, there is a the the increased prevalence that you see um uh is there in both men and women. Uh however, the study that we did uh and published in um so that's from the enhance if you see the enhance there's a table there which shows you that as the with the body mass index going up there's an increased prevalence of mgus both in men and women the study that we published in blood a few years ago looking at obesity in the south that was done only in women so we couldn't say anything about men mm -hmm. and women and it was an increased um risk i guess you should you can say and i know you know, it's controversial even to talk about treating smoldering myeloma early, um, and some people are starting to do that more. Is there anything that could be done early at the MGUS stage to inhibit progression? Yeah, we should just make sure that patients and doctors are aware that it's better to not do anything. I mean, you are going to cause more harm mm -hmm. uh, without by intervening in the absence of solid data mm -hmm. um the 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 point to remember is that mgus progresses to myeloma at 1% per year um yeah that's that so is again that is again uh, a not adjusted for other competing causes of uh, of mortality if you adjust for other competing causes of mortality the risk of progression in mgus is probably much lower even 0.5% per year or less and so um the vast majority of patients with mgus like 90% approximately will never get myeloma so if you try to screen and intervene after 10 years of intervention you may have a prayer of helping two or three people but you could have given bad treatment to 90 plus percent yeah so we just have to be more careful um particularly i see people wanting to do mri scans ct scans with all the mgus patients you're just going to increase false positives Mm -hmm. and cause more harm than good as in any screening study whether you take mammography colonoscopy uh, prostate cancer screening hiv treatment every one of those was backed up by randomized trials showing benefit or absence of benefit mm -hmm. we haven't gotten those kind of studies we don't even have interventions to test in those kind of populations so we shouldn't come up with ideas on how to screen or how to treat uh such uh low risk patients now smoldering myeloma is a different ball game because mm -hmm. the risk of progression in smoldering myeloma is 10% per year but even in that if you go beyond the first 5 years the risk drops off and so if you look at 100 people with smoldering myeloma 50 of them will will still be fine 5 years from now and 35 would be fine you know 10 years from now Mm -hmm. So then uh you have to be careful if you use treatments because all our treatments carry actually some life threatening consequences there is a certain percent of patients who can die from our treatment and uh we need to be sure that the risks outweigh the benefits we need to be uh, looking at what are the implications on quality of life again treating based on rationale has made mistakes in medicine over and over again we need randomized trials showing that what you hope you will achieve actually happens and so even in smoldering myeloma we are not looking at all patients with smoldering myeloma we are looking at patients with high risk smoldering myeloma so the mm -hmm. spanish study looked only at high risk smoldering myeloma they looked at a population with a 25% per year risk of progression to myeloma uh each year and in that population they found that early intervention may prolong survival 
but the but the tests that they use to identify those patients are not available worldwide so we cannot just take up uh, that study and incorporate it into practice so we are doing a, a trial right now in the US looking at uh, lenalidomide in smoldering myeloma high risk smoldering myeloma and that will help us answer some of these questions uh, we just need more data the very tip of the iceberg patients with smoldering myeloma who have ultra high risk like 40 50% risk of progression in the first year those patients we are willing to treat now because there's there's hardly any one of those who would not have progressed in two or three years mm-hmm. and that uh, will that is what people refer to as we start talking about intervening in myeloma early at the you know before the crab features happen and that would be ultra high risk smoldering myeloma patients and Dr. Dispensary wrote a paper in blood looking at you know exactly what uh, factors we'd be using to decide this and uh, right now we can look at three factors plasma cell percentage more than 60% free light chain ratio more than 100 presence of more than one focal lesion on an MRI exam any one of those three factors uh, in a patient with smoldering myeloma Mm-hmm. you're looking at a risk of progression of 40% per year for 2 years so most patients will have progressed in 2 years and um those patients are referred to as ultra high risk and we are ready to call them as myeloma and start therapy all the other patients with smoldering myeloma are either better off being watched or the more higher risk groups better off enrolling in clinical trials Yeah, I understand the caution and I think it's wise. I know patients with smoldering myeloma sometimes it's it's a hard head game to to know that you have something and and even at the MGA stage it's it's a right. challenge but, psychologically. Right. And right, but the treatment we are using is not like aspirin or Tylenol. These, these right. are risky treatments right. and we yes. need to know whether they actually work, uh, not just that they may work um, before we start intervening. and we need to take um and and that's not easy because if you go lower and lower risk it will take years before you know the answer so mm-hmm. i'm like you know we are if if you're not doing something it's not because we haven't um we don't have the time or want to do the effort but it's the it's you have it's a judgment call and we are always weighing the pros and cons and wrestling with the uh, you know whatever decisions we make you know it's like you you want to help people and and do it at the, at the same time you don't want to harm people. Mhm. Can we go back to obesity for a minute and maybe you don't mm-hmm. understand, you know, no you're not a, probably an expert on obesity because you're an expert in myeloma. But can you help us understand what biologically happens in obesity to make um that affects cells either with insulin or IL-6 or other factors like you know DNA repair or gene functions I'm not sure about where you know again cytokines like IL6 or IGF1 may be higher and may be involved uh, another possibility that you know I have been thinking about is hormonal differences um oh. there is a definite hormonal shift that happens uh, in obesity uh, with greater uh, male hormones uh, levels and so uh it it may be something to do with that because there's a clear gender difference in mgus and in myeloma if you look yeah. at the prevalence of mgus uh by age group women lag behind 5 years um the prevalence of uh, mgus in a 60 year old uh woman would be um the the same as a 50 year old man and mm. or 5 10 years difference is is always there uh and it may be that the estrogens are protective and the androgens are more driving um the prevalence of mgus so um i think that that may be one of the reasons why there is a discrepancy in obesity maybe with obesity the the hormonal uh, shifts uh, affect the prevalence are there homo- hormonal differences in levels between racial communities i uh, don't know I don't think we have measured or checked that um but that's you know good idea I don't know that whether but when we've done this enhan study all of the prevalence differences were were adjusted for all the factors that you can think of so we mm-hmm. are pretty sure that the the racial disparity persists after adjusting for everything else that might be confounding um 
but not not to the detail of hormonal levels whether that that drives it and uh, you may have answered this already but if you have MGUS or smoldering myeloma does obesity influence the time to progression um the 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 um the time to progression uh of MGUS to to myeloma and for smoldering myeloma to myeloma is is dictated by a number of risk factors uh for MGUS uh, the size of the monoclonal protein, the type of the monoclonal protein, the free light chain ratio are three factors that we use to to determine whether a patient with MGUS will, uh, you know, what rate will they progress to myeloma. If a patient has a small monoclonal protein, less than 1.5 grams, that is IgG in type and associated with a normal light chain ratio, the risk of progression of MGUS to myeloma is very low. Uh, it's only 2% over a patient's lifetime. And um, in such patients, maybe routine follow-up is not even needed. All you need to do is recheck in six months and then if they get symptoms. On the other mm-hmm. hand, for the other extreme, if patients have uh, more than 1.5 gram M spike with uh, uh, with uh, non-IgG subtype and high abnormal light chain ratio, the risk of progression uh, is much higher. Uh, it's like 3% per year or more. And so we we can risk stratify using that. And other things that uh, affect progression in MGUS might be the level of bone marrow plasma cytosis, you know, less than 5% versus 5 to 10%, the suppression of uninvolved immunoglobulins, whether they are there or not, and and circulating plasma cells and, and so on. In smoldering myeloma, we, we do know that uh, these kind of factors are, uh, are of value as well, like the light chain ratio, the size of the monoclonal protein, the amount of plasma cells in the marrow, uh, all uh, the circulating plasma cells uh, are all important. In addition, we know that the cytos, the immunophenotype of the plasma cells, and this is what the Spanish have done uh, elegantly, is to look at exactly what's on the surface of the plasma cells and using that to predict risk of progression. And uh, the the actual immunophenotype is valuable in uh, in assessing risk. We also know that the underlying cytogenetic subtype of smoldering myeloma will affect the progression rate. So 414 has a higher risk of progression to myeloma than 1114. Mm-hmm. And trisomies are in between. So we know that the underlying cytogenetic subtype does affect um, affect progression. If you see 17P in a patient with smoldering myeloma that patient has a higher risk of progression than patients who don't have 17P. So we are we are certainly getting specific risk factors. And you're you're saying those are probably more likely to be to determine the risk of progression than obesity. Oh yes, I, I mm-hmm. don't. I, I I'm pretty sure that those are very powerful factors. I don't know that we actually have data that. Um, that uh, obese uh, MGUS in um, uh, associated with obesity is more likely to progress than uh, MGUS not associated with obesity. I don't think we have data for that. Uh, race. Um, the earlier studies actually suggested that there is no risk, no increased risk uh, of transformation um, uh, based on race. Uh, however, the most recent NHANE study suggests there might be a slight increase in African Americans based on the type of MGUS they have, but we still need more data for that as well. Mm-hmm. And I had a, a patient ask, will myeloma doctors prescribe metformin for the obesity insulin hypersensitivity? And uh, I, don't know what met, I don't know what metformin is. So Metformin is a drug that's used for patients uh, with diabetes. Mm. Um, no, I mean, I will... As we've talked before, you know, with MGUS smoldering myeloma, we will intervene with therapies that are known to be effective. Mm -hmm. We cannot use therapies that we hope might help. So metformin is used if patients have diabetes. So if there is a diabetes doctor recommending metformin therapy to treat diabetes, that's okay. But Mm -hmm. I will not give metformin trying to lower the risk of MGUS or you know, change the risk of progression of MGUS to myeloma because that's completely unproven, and I need actual data for that. Mm-hmm. Can I ask how dexamethasone impacts the sugar levels in obesity? Because I know dex, 
um, changes your sugar sensitivities and in some instances could give you either temporary, um, you know, sugar issues and potentially yeah, yeah. Dexam- diabetes. Dexamethasone, mm-hmm. dexamethasone is basically a very potent version of the hormone in our body called cortisol. And cortisol is made by the adrenal glands, and it's one of those that increases the level of glucose in the body, and insulin decreases the level of glucose in the body. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're, they're hormones that act in opposite directions. When we give dexamethasone, we are giving supraphysiologic doses, very high doses of steroids. Mm-hmm. And that then those, it's an analog of cortisol, so it will really increase the blood sugar. And if you already are diabetic or if you already have obesity, then your ability to cope with that high blood sugar is going to be impaired. And so you see either patients with diabetes having completely out-of-control blood sugars or patients who are not even di- known to be diabetic start to declare themselves in the diabetic range from the use of steroids simply because this is an analog of cortisol and it will increase the sugar level uh, considerably. Hmm. Okay. So we so, have to monitor and, and yeah. actually some patients need insulin that they've never needed before. As we are starting to use lower and lower doses of steroids, hopefully this problem will be less. But you can make somebody diabetic just by giving them the dexamethasone that we use. Well, that's, well I noticed a big change in my ability to cope with sugars when I was on dex. Mm-hmm. I have a question about inflammation in general. So when you were talking about infection, and um, I've read some things that say that obesity is a a state of being in a state of inflammation, Um, are there other states of inflammation that you've seen, like either allergies or environmental factors that could cause a state of inflammation that could be the secondary trigger sort of event? Well, uh, you know, we have uh, we've always hypothesized that there is an increased risk of MGUS probably in states of chronic inflammation because in those states the plasma cells are trying to respond and there's greater chance for error. And that's one of the reasons we looked at rheumatoid arthritis in the NHANES study because the NHANES study captured that data. And there is an increased risk. Uh, it didn't reach statistical significance, though, so we are we're kind of like not sure. But in blacks particularly, the risk of um, MGUS in patients um, uh, with rheumatoid arthritis was uh, opposite of what we were expecting. Um, in uh, in the overall population, it uh, also it it. It didn't go the right direction. So, but on the other hand, there are other studies that we have done where we have found this increased risk. So, it's just like you know, we are not sure whether it's because we don't have the right sample size, we are not studying the right population. But there's always been a hypothesis that um, that uh, uh, chronic inflammatory states will have a higher risk of MGUS than patients without chronic inflammation. It's just been so difficult to prove because we just don't have, you know, good data sets to look at. And what do you consider to be constant um, or, you know, constant inflama- inflammatory states? Rheumatoid arthritis is an example. What what would be some other examples? Well, chronic infections. I mean, people have, um, uh, in the old days, tuberculosis would be a good one, connective tissue disorders like lupus, um, all of these were looked at, and, you know, pardon me, because sometimes I forget the studies that we have published. We did a study, and uh, it's published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. It's um, it's looking at approximately 16,000 patients in Olmsted County, um, looking at the prevalence of uh, each and every disease that has been in the, uh, you know, ICD coding. Uh, mm-hmm. Like there's over 16,000 diagnoses, and so That's we looked at the prevalence of each one in patients with MGUS and patients without MGUS, and it was an unbiased study because all patients had the test done for screening, and so it was not like you know why did they get tested? It was like the test was done on everyone, and then we looked at what is the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis in people with MGUS and what is it in people without MGUS, 
and the whole spreadsheet for the whole 16,000 different diagnoses is available on the Mayo Clinic Proceedings website. Mm-hmm. And anyone interested can go and explore and, and see, uh, you know, what's going on. But we we found only, you know, of the 150 different associations that have been lip- reported in the literature, we could confirm only a handful to be truly, you know, related to MGUS. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, partly maybe most of the others were coincidental. It could also mean that even with 16,000, we still didn't have sample size. Um so one of those two reasons could still be at play. And I've read some things about diet and inflammation, that certain foods are cause a constant state of inflammation, like sometimes glutens or sugars or alcohol or foods with nitrates or things like that. So do you think that has an impact at all? I don't know. Uh, again, you know, it's just so it's hard. hard to study because yeah. it's hard to control for this. Um, right. Uh, whether, like, you know, I think um, if you say why if Japanese have a lower risk, is that because of genetic difference or is it because of dietary difference? We don't know. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm. it's hard to say. It's just very hard to do those studies. Um, short of randomization, there's no way to be sure whether, there are, it's, whether it's cause and effect or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know when it comes to food, it's tough because it's hard to regulate and you would have to be very specific about different patient populations and what they right. were doing so you could get consistent results. Right. So so you mentioned also in the inflammation, have you seen any kind of pattern with either viral or bacterial infections being possibly the initial trigger for an MGUS state or a myeloma that's our, complication? That's our hypothesis, and there are some lot of um, basic science studies that have shown, you know, how the response may be increased uh, uh, in, 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 you know, in the initial step where the clone is established. Um, but nothing specific, you know, in terms of a particular infection that's, co- that's driving it. The other problem we we have is that when you diagnose MGUS, you already have had it for many, many years. So we don't know exactly when it started. So, you know, it could be an event that happened 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And Mm -hmm. it's hard to know when the MGUS started because it's silent. And when you're detecting it, it may have already been there. In fact, we have done a study in which we found that it's been there. When you diagnose an MGUS, it's likely already been there for 10 years. Wow. Median. So it's that makes it difficult, and then because the effect, you know, of the monoclonal gammopathy is immunosuppression in some patients, that will also increase the risk of infection. So then it's a chicken and egg: which came first? Mm-hmm. You know, is the infection uh, happening because of immunosuppression, or the infection caused the monoclonal gammopathy? Mm-hmm. So th- those are the those are the you know real practical problems we are trying to solve you know when when you're trying to do research so so we are trying we are doing a study trying to figure out you know if we can capture a population that did not have MGUS and and now they do and that way you know approximately when the MGUS happened and use that data. Hmm. What percentage of people do you think in in the population have MGUS? Well, like um, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, again, as we talk, it depends on race. And I think now for the United States, we have the, probably the best data is from the um, from the NHANE study. Um, it's uh, it's approximately we we had initially thought that approximately three percent of of the United States population over the age of fifty has an MGUS. Right now, the NHANE study would suggest it's more like two point five percent. And then, then that risk then varies according to race. With African Americans, it probably goes up close to five percent. Um, and uh, as you age over the age of seventy, then it also goes beyond five six percent uh, for the prevalence. Um, so that's quite a bit actually. If you talk three close to three percent of the population over the age of fifty, you're talking one in thirty people. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a fairly common condition. And so, you, again, we just diagnose only a very small proportion of patients with MGUS who have it in the population. We don't want to screen because we don't have anything to offer in terms of intervention. Mm-hmm. And other than, you know, stirring up anxiety, you don't really achieve anything. Right. 
Right, just make everybody and nervous. So, yeah, and, and yeah. plus nothing really happens to 90% of people. So it's mm-hmm. not no point in alarming people when most of them are going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Well, we've talked for an hour, and I know you have so much more to talk about, but I think we should have you on again to talk about a whole new topic <laughs> of study. Oh, thank you. Uh, Maybe we could you could just kind of mention. It sounds like there's a lot of study that needs to be done to follow up on some of these ideas or thoughts to to drive them to become reality. Can you talk about the importance of patient participation in clinical trials for you? Oh yeah, clinical trials are like key. And in myeloma, we've been blessed because uh, it is because of patients' willingness to participate in clinical trials that we have had so many advances. Um, Thalidomide, lenalidomide, bortezomib, carfilzomib, pomalidomide, and liposomal doxorubicin, six drugs, um, all of them uh, through big clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three. Patient participation was key in getting these drugs um, out into the market. And there are many other drugs that we know now are active, uh, ARI-520, daratumumab, uh, another CD38 antibody, SAR. Um, there's um, uh, cyclin D1 uh, inhibitors like dinocyclib. All of them have shown single agent activity. Others like elotuzumab, panobinostat are all showing promise, all because patients have been willing to participate. So I, I, first of all, I want to salute all the patients who have been willing to participate in large numbers to making these studies um, a reality and for making all these advances. There are many other trials that, are, that we are doing. Uh, one, uh, one thing to point out is that we do lag behind in accrual in the U.S. compared to Europe. And so we should pick up um, the clinical trial accrual here. There are several trials. You name the stage of disease from smoldering myeloma to newly diagnosed myeloma to transplant to relapse. For every stage of disease, most centers have a trial. So ask your doctors, you know, is there a clinical trial that would be good for me? I usually wear the doctor hat first. I mean, we will do what is best for the patient. Mm-hmm. And um, and not just because you're eligible for the trial doesn't mean we'll do the trial for you. If that's the best, uh, if that's in your best interest, then yes. But certainly ask physicians, um, is there a trial that I'm eligible for? Is that trial a good option for me? And then if so, uh, generally patients participating in clinical trials uh, have better outcomes, maybe because they're followed more closely. Uh, Some of it is because in myeloma particularly, most of our trials are with active drugs, not placebos. So you do stand a great chance for benefit. And it's really important to inquire and participate um, Most of these trials are designed very rigorously so um, uh, that the risk to patients is minimized. Well, thank you. I I think it would be remarkable if we could increase the participation rate from a 5% to 10 or 15 or 20 or 30%. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and trials are increasingly available at, uh, at, uh, at most centers. Uh, not just academic centers. Many community hospitals are participating in clinical trials. Uh, many nationwide trials are available through the CTSU to to most institutions in the U.S., these large cooperative group trials, and so seek them out. Yeah, some of these trials have, you know, 300 locations where they're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I take... Well, Dr. Rajkumar, we're so grateful for you taking the time to share with us today about obesity in race and myeloma, and we will certainly have you on again to talk about other topics that you're working on. But we're very grateful for your extensive and your very exceptional work to help find a cure and better treatments for this disease. We we thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks for having me. It was a a real pleasure talking to you, and you're just so knowledgeable. Uh, and you're doing an outstanding job for patients with both your websites. Uh, All the very best. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Innovation in Myeloma. Join us next week for our next inpatient radio interview as we learn more about how we as patients can help drive to a cure for myeloma by joining clinical trials.
With the Lucky Land Plus, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.